Right now, Acts chapter 28, of course, in chapter 27, it was that big, uh, the big storm, that big tempest they were caught in in the boat. And, um, you know, we went through all that. They, they basically um, landed the ship. It, it was a shipwreck. It, it um, basically broke in half, and they had to swim to the island. And everybody made it there as God had promised that they would, and they were there safe. So now we're catching up in chapter 28 that they're on this island. And, of course, in verse 1, it says they found out that the island is called Meliton. And um, it says in verse 2, the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. So basically the people of that island, you know, the indigenous people that live there, they're, they're barbarous people, right? They're not, um, they're obviously not, um, you know, like Jewish or Romans, you know, they're, they're the people that lived on that island. They call them a barbarous people, but it says they showed us no little kindness. They were real warm. They were, they were receptive. You know, they came in, there was this great storm. They made them a fire. They gave them some food. They were hospitable to them. Um, verse 3 says, And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. So basically, these, you know, they're, they're putting the fire together. Paul's going out. He's working. He's gathering, he's gathering firewood. He takes a bundle of sticks and he throws it on the fire. And when he does that, a snake jumps out of the sticks, basically, and, and, and clings to his hand, bites him on the hand, right? And um, these people see this. Verse 4, it says, And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Now these people, you know, in their own religion or their own superstition, they're looking at this and thinking that, oh, well, you know, this guy must have done something pretty bad. You know, he must be a murderer or something else because basically they're saying that fate, you know, vengeance, they're saying that he was not able to escape death, even though he did by the shipwreck, you know, obviously he did something bad because now there's this snake just biting him. And, and normally, see, they, when they saw this, the people of that island, they saw the snake, they saw him get bit. They were expecting Paul to die, right? They were expecting him to, to, to fall down dead. Or at least to swell and have some problems. But the Bible says he shook off the beast into the fire and he felt no harm. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time getting into this this morning. Because there's this, there's this crazy Pentecostal belief out there today. And I, it's, it's kind of hard to believe it's still around. It is. But it is. It is. You're right. It's, it, it's out there. And it's a snake handling um, belief. And, it, and, it's, and it's found in the Pentecostals. It's... Um, and even they even like drink poison and strychnine. You know, they do lots of lots of really weird things. And it's basically called a holiness sect. So these people they believe in in holiness, and they think you know it, they're all messed up on doctrine in a lot of ways. But I just saw when I was doing I was doing a little bit of research for this for this sermon tonight because I had heard about it. I, I knew about the snake handling and stuff. You know, you hear about these things, but I was wondering, I was like, is this still going on today? And it's in the news even up to last week. I mean, people are still doing this. They're doing this in West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. this stuff, Tennessee. Yeah, that, that whole area, that Appalachia area, there's a lot of these. I don't know if there's a lot, but there still are churches that practice this. And, and it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre teaching. And, and if you don't, if you're not aware of it, basically... <laughs> What they do is, is and we're going to get into the verses, why, why they believe what they believe. But um, they believe that they're supposed to be able to handle snakes if God leads them. If God leads you to pick up this, then they have the snakes like ready to go in service. right? They have them in boxes. Like it's part of their service. They have the snakes in boxes and they say, okay, you know, they play the music and they get all pumped up. And then, and then it's, if God leads them, then they go up and they just pick up these snakes and they kind of dance around with snakes. Just because they think that, you know, God says that they shall handle snakes. And they're saying, well, if God leads you to do it, then, then the snake's not going to bite you and you'll be, you'll be safe. You'll be fine. And, um, and it's really weird, too, because they also don't believe in receiving medical attention at all. They, 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 were, they, they always refuse medical attention. You know, if they get bit, they say, nope. And they just say, we're going to pray for it. And, and that's it. So they're, they're, they're basically tempting God. They... they, they they bring up these snakes and they just play with them, just kind of showing that, showing their faith, I guess is how, how they would put it. That's what they're doing. And they, and they think that God is leading them to do this. But um, there's actually a TV show that was just being, I, I, I don't watch TV, so I don't know anything about this. But um, 
National Pornographic, I mean National Geographic just made a TV show about this with a pastor and he just, he, they did this TV show and um, it, it must have been just recently. I, I don't know exactly what the time frame was and it was kind of like a documentary based on, on their church and, and their beliefs on this, this snake handling and that pastor from that show that they just filmed just died in February of what? A snake bite. It's a, it's a rattlesnake bite. He died of it. And his son took over as pastor of that church two weeks ago, or less than two weeks ago, he just got bit by a rattlesnake. Now, he didn't die, but it's like, you know, how much has to happen before these people realize, like, what are we doing here? You know, I mean, the pastor of the church, supposedly God's with him and God's leading him, you know, he gets bit by this rattlesnake and he's dead. And you know what? That's not an uncommon thing. Among these churches, church members die. They go to this church, they handle the snakes, they get bit by these poisonous snakes, and they die, yet they still think that they're supposed to do this as if, I mean, I don't even know. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's demented. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a warped, twisted view of, of the Bible and of Christianity and how we're supposed to, to, um, how we're supposed to worship and, and, and um <laughs> serve God. And here, just, here's what the verses that they use, basically. You could turn, turn to Mark chapter 16. Keep your finger in Acts 28, because obviously we're coming back here. But in Mark 16, it's the, the, last, uh, the last book, the last chapter in the book of Mark. I'll read from you Luke 10, verses 19 and 20. Luke 10, 19 and 20 says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So Jesus Christ was telling his disciples at, at that time when he was sending them out to preach the gospel, you know, they came back rejoicing. Like, they're like, Jesus, you know, even the, even the devils are subject unto us. You know, they were, they were, they were kind of boasting about it. They were happy about it. And they were, they were talking about it. And he says, look, I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. God's protection was with them when he sent them out to preach the gospel, is basically what was happening. He says, look, I'm sending you out to do this work, and I'm going to make sure that you're protected. So whether it's serpents, scorpions, whatever in the way, hey, they're not going to hurt you. I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of. But he said, notwithstanding, and this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. He's like, don't worry about the fact that you have, you know, they have this power over the devils. You know, that's not something you need to be glorying over. Just, just be happy at the fact that you're saved. Hey, your names are written in heaven. You know, rejoice over that. That is something to be happy. But in Mark 16, 15, so that's one of the verses, right, where Jesus was saying that, um, you know, I'm going to give you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions. So they'll take that and they'll just, and that's not the only verse, but they'll, they'll use that. And then with Mark 16, of course, here we have the famous verse, you know, the Great Commission, 1615, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A very famous verse, one that we live by, one that we, um, we definitely love here, that, of, of this admonition to preach the gospel to every creature. That's the Great Commission, right? But let's keep reading here. Look at verse 16. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And this is where you're going to get a lot of the Pentecostal doctrine from. This and from Acts chapter 2. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So one of the things they believe is that you have to believe and be baptized in order to be saved and go to heaven, which I've gone through this verse many times in the past where they seem to forget the next part that says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It doesn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. It says, it says um, he that believeth and is baptized. Now there's many different sects of Pentecostalism. There's, there's many different... Aspect, uh, um, sects out there. But there's a lot of them that believe that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That meaning, and they take that verse meaning that you have to be baptized in order to be saved as well. And um, again, there's so much other scripture in the Bible that says all you have to do to be saved is believe. So when it says here he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved is still a true statement, but it doesn't say you must be baptized to be saved. It just says, hey, I mean, I've said this before, hey, I could, I could believe and take a drink of water. Whosoever believeth and taketh a drink of water shall be saved. Right? The reason being, it's not because of the water, it's because whosoever believeth. Mm -hmm. Right? So as soon as you believe, if you say whosoever believeth and sits down in a chair and stands on their head and, you know, 
shall be saved, that's true, because as soon as you believe, you're saved. Um, that's basically why this verse is still completely consistent with the whole rest of the Bible, and it's not talking about a requirement of baptism to be saved. But let's keep going here, because um, that's, that's more of a minor point for this sermon. Verse 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So the, 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 the group that believes in this snake handling, and the ones that I was looking at, they believe that basically all of these things are going to follow anybody that believes. That all of these things will happen. And this is what they're teaching. They say, look, that um, you're going to be able to cast out devils. You're going to be able to speak with new tongues. And, and again, their version of speaking with new tongues is, is just kind of basically getting demon-possessed, rattling off all kinds of words that are unintelligible to anybody and rolling around on the floor. It's not, it's not uh, speaking with an actual language. When you study the word tongues in the Bible, it's always talking about a language. And it's language that people know. You look at Acts chapter 2. It lists off where everybody was from when it says they spake with other tongues. They spake in other people's languages. Everyone that was there in Acts chapter 2 was able to understand them in their own native tongue where they were born. They were able to understand them. God performed this miracle where even though they didn't, under, they didn't know how to speak those languages, God made it so that they were able to speak those languages and the people were able to hear them in the language in which they were born. And all throughout the Bible, when it talks about speaking with, with tongues and languages, it's, it's, that's exactly what it is. It's a language. It's something that people ought to be able to understand. And um, I, don't, I really don't want to get too, too far into the speaking in tongues things either because um, that's not what this is about. But it says here, they really focus on verse 18. It says, they shall take up serpents. So what they, the way they read that is just say, well, after you believe, right, these signs shall follow them that believe, you shall take up serpent, serpents. So they look at that as like a commandment that you shall take up serpents, that you need to do this. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. So they, they take these two verses and they, they, they say, well, it says they shall take up serpents, so we're going to take up serpents because we believe. And... <laughs> With no other scriptural evidence for this, no other, you know, no other place in the Bible does anyone talk about doing this. And, and actually, the reason why I'm bringing it up in Acts chapter 28 is because the only two places you could really go to for people even handling a snake at all would be here or in with Moses, where, where he, he is, uh, he turned his, God turned his rod into, into a snake, and he told him to pick it up, and it became a rod again in his hand. Those are like essentially the two times where, you, where you'd refer to of, of a biblical example of somebody actually in some way, you know, handling a snake. And it's, it, to me, it's so easy to see this. I, I don't understand how you cannot. But when Jesus is prophesying this and saying, look, there were a lot of miracles done at that time. There were a lot of, a lot of things done with the apostles were given special powers to go out and do things. You know, Paul was given special powers that it says, um, you know, even the handkerchiefs, he was able to, to heal people and, and was given these special powers that God had laid on him to do a lot of things. And um, as they were going out and spreading the gospel all over the place, basically, essentially for the first time, you know, of going out instead of having everything done within Israel and, and with, the, with the tabernacle and the temple, um, they were actually bringing the gospel to the Gentiles and going out and evangelizing in this way. He gave them these miracles as that, that initial evidence, right? To show them, um, to, to kind of show, and, and show the power of God's word and show the power of the salvation. And, and it, you know, this is something that, that everyone was able to see. So when it says here, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. We see this being fulfilled here in Acts chapter 28. Because that's exactly what happens with Paul. Look, God's leading Paul. Paul saved, he believes. He, he took up a serpent. Now, did he do it on purpose? I don't think so. I th the way it reads is that, you know, he just picked up some sticks to put in the fire, and then the snake came out and bit him. It's not like he was dancing around, you know, with a snake in his hand because Jesus said that you shall take up snakes. 
he got bit, but because God was with him and, and you know, God is, is protecting him, miraculously, he didn't, fall down, he didn't fall down dead and he didn't see any hurt. See, they watched him to see if he would swell. And it, I mean, according to the story, he didn't even swell. He felt no hurt. Now, the people that handle snakes today, when they get bit, they get hurt. Okay, that's why you see these, they, they, it, the venom affects them. They, they, it's not like the Apostle Paul here. They're not, they don't handle the snakes and then they feel no hurt. Now, if they're lucky, they don't die. But they do die, and it, and it happens all the time. And what, what, what Jesus was admonishing here about taking up the serpents and doing a, a deadly thing, look, he was protecting them when they were going out and preaching the gospel. We saw this. We saw his, the same thing in Luke 10 that I already read for you. And we see here a perfect example of this in the Apostle Paul by him not feeling any hurt, fulfilling exactly what Jesus Christ said in Mark 16, 18. And this is also where they get, if they drink any deadly thing, they, they practice drinking strychnine. Another thing, another bizarre thing that they do is they handle fire. Where they actually put fire over their arms or their face or over different parts of their body. And when I saw that, I was like, well, how in the world? Now look, I could understand, I could <laughs> sort of understand this one phrase of taking up serpents. And obviously they're, they're taking that to a, to a very weird extreme and, and totally misinterpreting that. But I don't I, I have to figure out, well, what verse in the Bible could they possibly use for burning themselves with fire? Where does that come from? And it, I, I, what they said, you know, out of their mouth, because this is, this is where I heard is, is Hebrews 11, right? Is the faith chapter. In Hebrews 11, verse 33, it says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Verse 34 says, quenched the violence of fire. So it's talking about people who had faith quenched the violence of fire. So what they do is they take up fire and they say, we're the, it's not going to do any violence to us because we have faith. Yeah, yeah, I know. The look on your face says it all. It's a, I don't understand how you can take that because obviously, look, Hebrews 11 is talking about people of the Bible who had great faith. And instead of getting into every single individual story again, it kind of recaps all of these different things that men of faith have been through, right? Um, stop the mouths of lions. Obviously, that's a reference to Daniel and the lion's den, right? He had great faith and God protected him. God kept him from that harm and from that evil. Quench the violence of fire. Again, right after that, stop the mouths of, li of lions. Referring to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being tossed into the burning, fiery furnace and feeling no harm. They had no harm come on them. You know, escape the edge of the sword, our weakness, right? Look, all these different things, that's, that's a very simple, basic um, understanding of Hebrews 11 when it goes through Moses and Abraham and everyone else talking about how, how great people of faith they were. Then at the end, it kind of summarizes this, but they take that verse and just totally rip it out of context to justify trying to burn themselves and saying that that is, is you know, somehow makes them faithful. Now, I think one of the reasons why people get sucked into this is because they want to see a real sign from God. They, they look at that and say, well, God's really moving here because these people are doing something that seems real incredible. It's kind of fantastic. You know, they're handling snakes. And sure, when they don't get bit, you can look at that and say like, wow, that must be real. You know, God must be in that because how could you take up snakes and not get bit? And, and how could you put fire over yourself and not get burned? And they'll look at this great show. And that's what it is. It's a show. They're putting on a circus. They're putting on a show to, to, and, and, um, you know, to try to convince people or convince themselves. I don't know. I think a lot of people get caught up in this are honestly deceived. But that's what it is. It's a deception. And they think that, that all the, the hooting and hollering and dancing and rolling in the aisles and picking up the snakes and dancing around and doing the fire is of the Holy Spirit. When it's, when it's not, it's not, a, it's not the Holy Spirit of all, at all. It's, it's, I believe it is a spirit. I believe there's many times where there is a spirit involved, but it's, it's, not, it's not of God. It's not the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in, Max, in Max, Matthew 
12, verse 38, it says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see of thee a sign. We would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. We don't need a sign from God to know that God's real. We don't need that type of a proof. And actually, we shouldn't be seeking after that type of a sign from God. Jesus Christ said that an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. We don't need to see these things as evidence of God, but I think that's what a lot of people do. There's this, there's this um, you know, they think it's a proof, it's an evidence for God to, to see these types of events. But um, I would say there's actually proof to the contrary that these things are not of God. And, and the, the first proof from Scripture that I could give you on snake handling being of the devil would be when, was when the Satan was tempting Jesus Christ. In Matthew 4, verse 5, it says, the Bible reads, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So he's saying, the devil's basically going to Jesus saying, look, God promised to protect you. He says, look, if you're the son of God, because God promised to protect you, hey, we're going to go up on here, throw yourself off this building, because hey, the angels are going to protect you. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna pick you up. They're going to make sure you don't get hurt so you don't dash your foot against a stone. He's saying, see, do this, you know, prove it. Prove you're the son of God because he said this was going to happen. You don't have to worry about it. But Jesus answered him in verse 7. He says, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I believe that's exactly what these people are doing with the snake handling. Look, if God makes a promise, he's going to protect you. Amen. And I believe that. And I'll, and I'll hold, you know, I believe God at his word, it'll protect us. But to go around then and to start just, just handling these things on purpose, going into this, this danger for no reason at all, no good reason, just, just, just to put yourself in that danger. I mean, there's no reason for Jesus Christ to cast himself down just so that the angels could protect him. Look, there's no reason to pick up these snakes and handle them just to, to, to tempt God to, to say that, look, I'm going to hold these. Look, you said you're not going to bite me, right? You said you're not going to bite me, so I'm going to hold them and, and do that. That's, that's, that's silly. That's ridiculous. That's tempting God. That's something that we're not supposed to do. But I would say the second and more obvious proof about, about the whole snake handling thing is just look at their doctrine. Look at what they believe. Every single person that believes in and practice this, practices this stuff is not saved. They're not saved. They're not of God. They believe you could lose your salvation. They believe that, that if you're not living holy, if you're not doing the good works, that you can, you can end up going to hell. And the Bible is very clear on that, that once you're saved, hey, you're saved forever. It's eternal life. You can never lose that salvation. We had a great uh, conversation about that a little bit earlier this afternoon. But it's, it's eternal life. And if you don't believe that, you're making God a liar. If you don't believe that God has given unto you eternal life and this life is in His Son, then you don't believe the record that God has gave of His Son and you're calling God a liar and therefore you are not saved. And when you look at these things, you know, anything you want to know, you know, it doesn't automatically prove everything wrong about everything someone believes. But I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. If they're the only group that believes doing a certain thing, and they're not right on salvation, they're not right on, on, that, on that weird doctrine either. Okay. There's a lot of things they might believe that, that, are, that are common among other, you know, among other denominations and other sects. You know, just because they're wrong on salvation doesn't mean that every single thing that they do or believe is wrong. But if they're the only ones doing that and they're wrong on salvation, they're wrong on that. But um, let's keep reading here. Keep reading in Acts chapter 28. Go back to Acts chapter 28. So it says in verse 6, it says, Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So now these people, I mean, these people are kind of messed up too, but they, um, you know, they see he had no harm. He didn't fall down dead. He didn't even swell. So then they went from thinking that, hey, this guy must be a murderer, you know, vengeance suffereth them not to live, he must be a really bad guy. And then when they see this happen, they're like, wow, this guy must be a god, right? And um, 
so they they obviously had uh, messed up beliefs, but um, it's funny how they went from, from thinking he was a murderer to thinking he's a god. Um, verse number 7, it says, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius. So Publius is the, is the leader there. He's a the chief guy who received us and lodged us three days courteously. So he's, he's taken care of them while, while they're there. Verse 8 says, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So we see Paul now coming in and he's already amazed the people of the island with, his, um, with the fact that he didn't die or even get hurt with that snake. And now he comes in when, um, when the, the, the chief leader, Publius, his father was sick, and Paul comes in and heals him, right? And um, he just he lays his hands on him, he prays for him, and he, and he heals him. It says in verse 9, So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. So Paul comes in, and he heals a lot of people. He's doing a lot of miracles. And, you know, we've seen, these, we've seen the apostles and the disciples do these miracles in other places as well. You know, they were doing it throughout uh, Jerusalem and Judea and, and going out to the Gentiles. And God had given him this power. Now, it's interesting, too, in this chapter, because we we're just talking about the, the, the Pentecostals and there's all those different beliefs they have. And another one that they believe in is, um, is healing. And they'll say that this is something that that you know um, that people can do now, and I want to I want to clear this up. I want to make sure I'm very clear about this because I'm not saying I don't believe it's possible for God to heal people at all because I do believe that 100% today. Um, I don't believe that we have. I, I, believe, I do believe there's a lot of charlatans out there, and you see that by and large in the, in the Pentecostal movement, the Benny Hins. And, and these other, these other um, you know, big name preachers that are out there and they'll, and they'll slap people on the forehead and say that they're healed. And it's, and it's a facade. It's a show. It's, it's not real. They're not of God. Again, if you're not saved, you're not going to have the power of God to heal people like this. Um, I do believe that God is able to heal people today. I believe he's able to perform miracles today. I believe he's always been able to perform miracles. However, I also believe that the apostles were endued with, with extra, you know, special powers from God at that time for a specific purpose to be able to go around and do these things that, that we don't see as much, that you don't see today. Um, turn, if you would, to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 gives us some, some very good scripture on, um, on people being sick and how we ought to handle that and how we ought to deal with that. James chapter 5, verse 13 reads, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Obviously, when someone's sick, when someone's in, you know, in need, if someone's sick or um, you know, hurt, we ought to pray for him. The church ought to pray for him. This is very, very scriptural. I'm not against that at all. And I do believe, as the Bible says, that the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I believe that. And the Lord shall raise them up. And if you have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Um, I also don't believe, though, that it's wrong to ever see a physician or to go to, go to a doctor. I don't think that's a lack of faith. I think what we ought to do first is go to God. He's the first place that we go to with everything, with all of our needs. We always pray to God. We always go to Him first. But in, um, in, in an example of, of someone who didn't go to God would be Asa in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12. You don't have to turn there. It says, And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. So Asa ended up dying from his disease. He didn't go to God first. He just went to the physicians. 
And I don't think that we should just be going to the physicians. I think we need to go to God first and, and always go to God with everything that we have and we should pray for him. However, I don't think it's a sin. I don't think it's wrong to go to a physician you know, if you're already praying and stuff to go see it, I don't think that's a lack of faith or a lapse in your faith. I believe God's able to use people, to use physicians as well as other people to, to, to lay hands on you. It doesn't always have to be a miraculous event either. And um, God gives us, you know, our, our bodies that we are supposed to take care of. We are supposed to maintain. We're supposed to be healthy. We're supposed to do these things. And... Um, Let's see, what, what's a good analogy? A good analogy for this would be like... Um, okay, I'll tell you one. I, I got one, I got one. Think about, you know, if God... It, it, we're supposed to provide for our family as men, right? You're supposed to provide for your family. He says, if you don't, you're worse than an infidel. Now, if I were just to say, well, I need to go to God for everything, and you should. Again, you should. Look, if I, if I need to find a job, if I'm out of work, hey, I'm going to pray to God to help me find a good job so I can help, help support my family. But if that's all I did was sit around and just pray and pray and pray and pray and pray, guess what? You know, God's not going to open up you know, money that will fall down onto the floor and say, okay, here, you prayed enough, now you could provide for your family. No, that's not how it works. We need to get up and do the hard work. We need to go out and, and you know, yes, pray to God. Bring Him all of your concerns and bring Him all of your needs. Absolutely. And, I, and, and if you don't do that, maybe he won't bless you finding a job. But look, go to him first, but then go out and do it. Okay? And that's the key. It's the same thing with our health. Right? Go to God first. When you have a problem, and I do this, I, I won't lie to you, you know, when I have a headache, or when I have other ailments, when I have other things around, look, I'm going to pray to God first. That's the first thing I want to do. And, you know, I, I, I'm human, obviously, sometimes I forget, but look, we ought to be going no matter what the problem is. When we hear about other people being sick, what's the first thing we do? We pray for them. We're going to pray. We'll tell other people to pray. We'll get the church to pray. That's why we have our prayer list. That's why we have people that have diseases in here. Because look, as a church, we're going to pray for them. And we believe that the prayer of the faithful, you know, uh, God, God will hear that prayer and, and he can answer that prayer. I mean, it's up to God if he's going to do it, but God has the power to do it and there is power in prayer. But, but, but it doesn't mean that we should just, that we should just never go to the doctor either. You know, Ernst Angle, and, he, uh, he refused... I mean, Ekin Hoyer refused to um, insulin to one of his you know, church members because they want to stand on faith. Yeah. And the person died and he got sued. Yeah, d well, that's... <laughs> I'm not going to get into the whole legal issue of it, but um, it's, it is, it, you know, you ought not to... Um, this is not what the Bible is teaching. The Bible is not teaching us that you can't ever go to a doctor. Now, there are, there are instances, and I believe here, like in Luke, 8, 40, in Luke chapter 8, uh, verse 43 says, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. Now, there are, lots of, there are lots of physicians of no value, I believe, in the world today. There's lots of doctors that, that you know, they claim to be helping and everything else, and they're not. They're not doing any good at all. And in many cases, they're even harming you. Okay? So it's not saying that all doctors are good or all doctors are bad. Now, just because those doctors exist doesn't mean that there aren't, there aren't good ones out there as well. Right? Now, this woman, she, she gave all of her money and everything to the, to the physicians, to the, to the world's doctors. And we see this happening today. I mean, I look at this and I just can't help but think about cancer, right? I mean, there's people who spend all of their living today and they just can't be healed. But what happened? God was able to heal them. Now look, we need to be going to God first because God can heal anything. God is, nothing is too hard for God. He's able to do this. But um, just because we have some of these examples, you know, and I think these are both good examples of, of um, you know, the world not being able to heal you. And obviously there's a lot of symbolism here with, um, with people being healed. You know, you get healed spiritually when you go to God, and, and God but God is also able to heal us physically. Um, but you think about, you know, Jesus Christ himself said, just, just to show you that, you know, the Bible says that, it's, that I don't believe it's a sin to go to a doctor. In Matthew 9, verse 12, it says, But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So basically what he's saying is, look, if you're whole, if you're well, if, if everything's fine, you don't need a physician. And that's what, like, I don't go in and get my physicals because if I'm fine and I'm well, look, I don't need a physician. But besides that, look, 
But he says, but they that are sick. So he's saying, look, are people that are sick are in need of a physician? Yes. So Jesus, if, if it were wrong to go to a doctor to seek medical care at all, ever, then Jesus wouldn't have said that they that are sick do need a physician in, in what he's saying here. Look, there's nothing wrong with going to see a doctor. And, you know, I don't know if anyone here thinks that there is or not, but um, because we're looking, we're kind of wrapped up with a lot of this Pentecostal beliefs here and the snake handling thing where they're, you know, they're told not to go to the doctor and it's all, it's all based on, look, you need to have the faith. And there's lots of people out there, even not just the Pentecostals, that believe that, that you, you shouldn't go to a doctor because you ought to have the faith to just pray it through. And I don't believe that for a second. Physicians have a time and a place and a usefulness. And it's not a lapse in faith to go to these people. Look, you don't have to have a lapse in faith to go and see a doctor. Don't lose your faith. You know, continue to pray. Continue to do these things. Absolutely. Do that first and continue to do that. And continue to do that to, you know, when you go to a doctor. But to say that you, you can never go to a doctor, otherwise you don't have faith, is ridiculous. It's, it's just simply not true. And you think about even Luke. Luke was a physician. right? The, the gospel according to St. Luke. Luke was a physician. Luke was the, called the beloved physician, right? Nothing wrong with going to see a doctor, but just, um, just be careful of the doctors that you do go to, that they are not physicians of no value, but they're physicians that, that actually are serving a good purpose and that, um, that are able to heal. But let's, um, let's keep reading here. I'm going to jump down to um, verse number 11. It says... And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Pudioli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from thence... When the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Now, um, we're supposed to be, as, as, you know, as Christians, as children of God, an encouragement for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we see Paul here, right? He's on his, it's a kind of a long journey. You know, they're, they're, they're traveling by boat and they're trying to get to Rome because obviously, you know, there are all these prisoners and Paul is one of the prisoners. He needs to get to Rome because he appealed unto Caesar earlier. And um, anyways, they're on this journey. And when the other, when other Christians hear about it, when other brethren hear that, that Paul's in the area, right? They're like, hey, look, stay with us. Stay with us for a week. You know, you're, you're on this long travel. You need it. You need it. You guys take a break. Stay with us for a week. And then it says when they go on further, these people had heard that Paul was traveling. It says, and they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum. Now, I'll be honest with you, I am not very well familiar with all of these geographic regions. It says, in the three taverns. I don't know where Appii Forum and the three taverns are, but when he says they came to meet us as far as, it means they had to travel a bit to get there. Okay, it wasn't just that like he they were right in that city and they just went out to see him because he was at the port or something. They actually made it a, a point to go out and travel a bit, however much, I don't know exactly, but they made it a point to travel out there to see him and to comfort him. It says, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Never lose sight of this, especially as men, okay? Now the women probably get this a little bit better than the men do, but... Um, as a man, you have a tendency, especially with other men, to think, oh, yeah, they're doing all right. They're doing good. You know, you don't, don't, I don't need to do anything for them. Because men, I mean, you have a tendency to be strong and, and to, to think yourself as strong, you know. But, hey, everybody, every man and every human being, when you go through hard times, when you're experiencing things, you know, you could get worn down, you could get beat down, you have a lot of things happen, you could deal with a lot of stress, you deal with a lot of just different things going on in your life. And, and this traveling, I mean, he's still a prisoner. Now, they gave him some liberties, but he's still a prisoner. I mean, he's still not, not in the best of shape. He, he had just gotten shipwrecked, you know, earlier in the journey. But these people said, you know what? We're going to make it a point to go out and see Paul. And they made, a tra they made a trip. They made a trek and journey to go see him. That encouraged Paul. That gave him courage. He blessed God. He thanked God that these people just came to see him. Now, they didn't have to do that, but they, they decided to. And, and oftentimes, when, when, you, um, 
Especially when we go through hard times, when a brother or sister in Christ comes and just says, hey, you know, I, I heard you're going to be over here. And even if you're not going through a hard time, it's encouraging. I remember when we, we took the trip out to, out to Sacramento when Brother Jimenez was starting his church and, and how much he said that that encouraged him, that people just came and showed their support. I mean, it's the same thing when we started our church here. We had a lot of people come and just showed the support and, you know, and traveled and, you know, from Phoenix or from other places and kind of traveled far. Hey, that means a lot. That meant a lot to me, and that means a lot to people when you could show, hey, I care about you, and I'm willing to make, the, make a journey. I'm willing to make that travel to go and see you. And, and we ought to keep that in mind. You ought, you ought to remember that. If you're going to take a trip somewhere, or if you know someone, I mean, it's not crazy just to, to take a trip specifically to go out and, and just to strengthen, just to encourage a brother or sister in Christ, especially when you know that they're going through some kind of hard times. I mean, he's going to face court. You know, he's going, he, he's got a, you know, he's appealed unto Caesar. He's appealed unto the top guy. He could use some encouragement. And, and even if you have nothing else to do for them, if you have nothing else to offer, just, just showing up and being there and being that moral support, it, it can do a great deal to one's mindset and one's attitude. Um, it, it really can provide a lot of strength and a lot of comfort. And, and Paul recognized this here, and he thanked God for that because it really was a, a big deal for him. And, um, you know, as a church, even if you're not making a, a long trip, right, in, in this church, we're not supposed to be just a, a group of strangers that gather together to sing praises of God and hear the Bible preached and then just go home. This is a family. I mean, if you're born again, you're, if you're a child of God, you are a child and joint heir with Christ, but everyone else that's saved are also children and they're brethren, they're brothers, they're sisters. And we need to treat this church as, as a local family because that's what we are. And we need to look out for each other. We need to edify one another. We need to encourage one another, be there for each other and, and get to know people on a personal level. Get to know them in their lives. Care about them. Know what's going on with them. Know what, you know, what are you dealing with? And just, just make friends. People oftentimes just need that encouragement. It's hard. Look, you ought to be able to stand alone with God. You ought to. Right? But again, we're all human and, and there's a lot of times we fall. We need that encouragement as well. And, and we need to do as much as possible to, to make sure that we're that we're keeping up with people. And, and when, when visitors come in, be friendly with them, talk to them. When, you know, not just visitors, but just everyone. I mean, people make people feel welcome if, you know, we're brothers and sisters here, we're a family. And, and that encouragement is extremely important. And I know everyone here, I'm sure, has felt some own encourage, personal encouragement in their own lives. I know I have. I mentioned already when the church got started. It can really boost you and, and just, just help you to get through a lot of things just by having that encouragement. And, um, but let's, uh, let's keep reading here in the story. Well, actually, before I do that, I got one more scripture reference I want to read. Um, from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, this, this kind of helps illustrate what I'm getting at here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 4 reads, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Verse 5 of, of chapter 7 says, For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. So we see here, during this difficult time, he says, I am exceeding joyful in our tribulation. Tribulation, that's hard times. Right? You have a lot of bad things happening to you. He says, when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We weren't, able to, you know, we weren't getting much rest for our flesh. We weren't able to sleep very well. Uh, it says, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. They're, they're scared they're inside. Look, there's all these fightings, there's all this tumult, there's all this persecution, there's all this tribulation going on, and they're, and they're scared, right? It says, nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down. He's saying, look, we're cast down. They needed some help. They needed some encouragement. 
And God brought that comfort by the coming of Titus. God used Titus as the instrument to bring them that comfort. And God uses people oftentimes, and remember that, and, and you, know, you don't always necessarily know when God is leading you or directing you. you don't all, you're not always going to know, hey, God's leading me to this person. Just keep people in your mind that, um, because God will lead you, and He can lead you, whether you realize it or not. Um, but if you have this mindset, if you have this attitude of, of watching out for other people, you could comfort them. And not only were they comforted by the presence of Titus, but also that the news that they gave, the consolation, it says, the consolation wherewith you is comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. So not only was Paul happy to see Titus there, his friend, his fellow laborer, he was also happy to hear the good news that he brought. Because these people, you know, again, this is the, the second epistle to the Corinthians. And Titus was telling them that, um, look, these people, they've got an earnest desire. They were sad about those, you know, the, the, they had a godly sorrow over some of the sins that were going on. But look, they're doing good. They've got a fervent mind toward, toward Paul. Like they're thinking about you. They're wanting to do what's right. You know, um, John, John said in... in, in um, in 1 John, I believe, he says, I have no greater joy than that my, my children walk in truth. Right? And, and I'm not sure if that's in 1 John or not. It's in one of the epistles of John. Um, it's also you know, good to hear glad tidings of good things, of, of things that, um, that other churches are doing well, that other people are following Christ and, and are living a good example. That's also an encouragement. And... Um, you know, we ought not to forget that, that people need encouraging, even if it doesn't appear that way on the outside. You can look at someone, you don't know what they're going through. You don't always know. And we should try to get to know people, especially in the church, but, but you, don't, you don't always know. Sometimes people don't share things with you. But try to be an encouragement to them. Just, just, just give them that fellowship. Give them that, the words of encouragement. And, and let's be there for each other within this church. Well, let's keep reading here. It says, um, in verse 17, it says... Or in verse 16, it says, And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So Paul's getting a little bit of special treatment here. Uh, it kind of makes sense after everything that went on in the boat. And, and, and um, you know, he's also just kind of in good favor with God and with man. But look at verse number 17. It says, And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of your fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So he's, he decides, you know, he gets to Rome, he's there for a few days, and he calls all the, all the chief, you know, the, the leaders, the chief elders of the, of the people together, of the Jews. And he says, look, even though I haven't done anything wrong, I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers. He says, look, I'm being accused of these things. Even though I haven't done anything wrong, I was delivered a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He's saying, look, this is why I'm here. I was delivered a prisoner all the way from Jerusalem, even though I haven't done anything wrong. So he's trying to explain himself a little bit here. Verse 18 says, who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death. Then he's saying, look, when they examined me back there, I, th there was no reason for me to be bound or, or to, to be put to death or anything. He says, they would have let me go. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. So he's saying, look, I was constrained. I was forced to do this because the Jews wouldn't let it go. He said, they kept on trying to get, you know, to they're, they're basically bringing them to law and, and trying to get them put to death. And he's saying that the people that heard him, were Felix, Agrippa, Festus, they were going to let him go. But he was constrained to do this because the Jews would not let it rest. They would not let it, let it go. And he says that, um, he says, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of it. Look, I'm not trying to be here accusing them of anything. Verse 20 says, for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And again, it's a, it's a, a similar defense we hear him making all throughout the book of Acts here when, um, especially the latter part, 
where he's saying, look, it's the hope of Israel why I'm bound in this chain. It's the hope of that resurrection. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. As, the, as Moses and all the prophets taught, I believe that. And that's now why I'm in chains. That's now why I'm bound. Because I believe this. I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, which is the hope of Israel. And it says in... Um, Verse 21, And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. So they're basically saying, we haven't heard anything about this. Because Paul's expecting that they would have heard this by now. I mean, it's already been you know, a, a, quite a while since he left for Jerusalem. They were landed on the island and everything else. Long travel. But um, you know, he called them together then when he gets there going to straighten things out with the chief priest, even though he still has to go before Caesar. He wants to get things straightened out there with the chief priest. And um, they say, we haven't received any letters. We haven't heard anything about this. And nobody has come or spoken anything bad about you, any harm about you. But in verse 22, it says, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So they're saying, okay, no one came and said anything bad about you. We don't really know what's going on, but we still want to hear you. Let's hear you out. I want to, you know, we want to hear what you have to say because everyone's talking bad about this. You know, everyone's talking about bad about this sect that, you know, these Christians, these people that, that believe in Christ, it's just being, being talked against. So they wanted to hear what he had to say. Verse 23 says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many unto him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believe the things which were spoken and some believe not. And this hasn't changed. This goes on to this day. We ought to be persuading people about Jesus. And I mentioned this earlier in another chapter because this is, um, Paul does this. You know, he, he goes to the, to the Jews. He's going to these people. He's saying, He's using the law of Moses and the prophets. He's going through all the Old Testament scriptures. He's saying, he's proving that Jesus is the Christ. He's proving that and he's trying to persuade them, saying, look, you know, look at the scripture and he's, and he's showing them the prophecies and showing them how Jesus matches that. And, and he's trying to persuade them, which is exactly what we do when we go out and talk to people. We knock on doors and, and we try to give people the gospel. It's a persuasive thing. You want people to get saved. I mean, the whole purpose you're there is trying to save their soul from hell. You show them how Jesus Christ died for their sins and you engage them and talk to them and try to get them to understand the free gift of salvation. And no matter how eloquent you are, no matter how even spirit-filled you are, when, when, when you preach, when people listen to you, some are going to believe and some are not going to believe. Right? That's always the way it is. Everyone has free will. You're not always, you know, you can't make somebody believe something they, they have to be shown now which is exactly why we persuade people because you, you want them to change their mind you want them to repent you want them to convert and to put their faith in Christ and it could be a very persuasive thing you want to show them whatever evidence is necessary for that person to get them to change their mind and you try to figure that out but not everybody is going to believe um, and you just have to keep that in mind don't get discouraged when you go out and you talk to people and they don't believe Try not to let that get you down because, you know, again, we, ha we have free will and God has given that. Um, it's, it's on them. You just need to do your best to show them as much as possible um, and, and um, just try to engage them and just do what God has commanded us to do and preach the gospel. But let's continue reading here. It says in verse 25, it says, When they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by his eyes, the prophet, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when they had heard, and when they had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Now, Paul basically is he, he's, it says he was talking to them from morning until night. He's spending a lot of time showing them scripture and showing them the Bible, showing them, look, 
you know, Jesus Christ fulfilled these prophecies, trying to get him saved, and he, he ends up just saying, okay, look, and, and he's always had this, this heart for, for the Jews, for his, the people of his own nation, and going to him. But remember, I mean, it's a common theme throughout the book of Acts. He's saying, basically, okay, I'm done with you. I'm going to the, from henceforth, I go to the Gentiles. And then he goes into another city, and he's, you know, again, he's going in the synagogues, he's talking to the Jews, and then, you know, there, he deals with a lot of stiff necks, a lot of hard hearts and people just not wanting to receive it and actually going and attacking him. And, and, you know, all of the persecution we see in the book of Acts coming at Paul was done by the hands of the Jews. The people that, that just didn't want to hear what he had to say, they, they actually hated it. They thought he was a heretic. They thought he was, he was doing against God's work. And um, so he ends up quoting here this, this scripture from the, from the Old Testament. I'll quote it real quick from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6 says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And that's the scripture basically that he's quoting to them, that he's, that he's applying to them, saying that their ears are dull of hearing. They've heard the truth. They've heard enough of it. They've seen it. And especially the, you know, the chief priests, and not necessarily at Rome, but in these other places, um, they were the ones that killed Jesus Christ. They're the ones that, um, you know, they saw the miracles. And, and a lot of them were the ones that blasphemed the Holy Ghost. They said that, you know, that, that what Jesus was doing was of the devil. And they hath not forgiveness. And, and, and their heart is hardened and it's darkened. And it says, uh, and, he, and he ends this with, um, and what I think is interesting about Isaiah chapter 6, because verse number 10, it says, Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. And um, these are people that, that, have, that have pushed it too far. Where, um, where they become reprobate. And it says, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And Matthew 13, I'm not going to get in there. I don't have enough time tonight. But um, when they asked Jesus, why do you speak unto them in parables? He says, because unto you it's given to know mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. It's not given for them to know the, the, um, the mysteries of God. And then, he, and then he goes on and um, quotes this same passage here. For these people hard as wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Um, there's a lot more I want to get into on that tonight, but I don't have the time. But anyways, Acts, the book of Acts is a great book. I hope you learned something throughout the, this whole journey through the book of Acts. My personal favorite book um, Lots of great stories of, of people doing great things for God. The acts of the apostles, their actions. And, um, you know, we, wa we want to strive to be people who can do actions, who go out and do good works for God, who go out and preach the gospel and have boldness and we're filled with the Spirit and we're able to do the good works um, as we have these great examples before us that are written down for our admonition. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for the book of Acts. Lord, um, I, I don't know, I feel like not everything came out the way that I had intended tonight, dear Lord, but I pray that uh, maybe something that was said was, uh, would sink down and, and give us a better understanding of you and of what you have for us, dear Lord. Help us not to get caught up in any of these distractions of these, of these um, false religions and false sects that go around and, and, and do these, these things like the snake handling, dear Lord. Um, I pray that you would please just give us discernment through your word and, um, and just help us understand what you have for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.